Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thanks for joining this session at the GGAA 2022. Um, a very prestigious meeting. I'm very uh, pleased to be able to contribute. I'm only sorry I can't be there in person. I had a, a nice experience at a previous greenhouse gas and animal agriculture uh, conference in Dublin. Um, that, was, that was a very good meeting too. Um, my name is Philip Skuse. I'm a principal scientist at the Mordon Research Institute just outside Edinburgh. Um, and I'd like to present some work we've been doing on reducing livestock greenhouse gas emissions through improving animal health uh, from a, a UK perspective. And I'd like to present that on behalf of myself, but also um, Michael McLeod, who many of you will know from Scotland's Rural College, and also Nigel Miller, who you may not know so well. Uh, Nigel is the chair of the UK-wide Ruminant Health and Welfare Group. Um, so just to, just to make a start and um, some sort of key points at the outset, uh, that morbidity and mortality due to animal disease uh, is, is thought to be responsible for the loss of upwards of 20% of livestock production globally. And I saw this statistic actually tweeted this morning, so it's a pretty live, uh, a live figure. Um, and that can be caused by exotic disease outbreaks, and we're familiar with foot and mouth disease and blue tongue and African spine fever. They can cause huge losses, as we know. But also I'd make the case that endemic disease is equally important, also causes huge losses. The production limiting by definition, so can cause death, poor live weight gain, uh, abortion, reduced milk yield. And in this part of the world, it would be diseases like mastitis, and Yoni's disease, and parasitic gastroenteritis. So just to make the point that high herd and flock health status will, will help reduce losses, uh, improve production efficiency, and help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. It all seems very intuitive, but there isn't a huge amount of data, but there is a policy back uh, context to this. Uh, it's being picked up at a sort of high level policy now. This is a quote from the UK Climate Change Committee's report 2020 on the list of low carbon farming practices. So it's quite reassuring to see that they, they think that the most cost effective measures from a mit mitigation perspective are improving livestock health. And on the back of that, a number of other organizations, some of which you may or may not have heard of, have, have been very busy in this part of the world trying to, to put some meat on the bones, if you like, and pardon the pun. Um, groups like the Independent Farming 1.5 Degrees Inquiry in Scotland, um, the Scottish Government have also set up these farmer led groups. There's a Beef Suckler Climate Scheme, there's a, a dairy group, there's a Hill and Upland and Crofting group. Uh, they've all reported and, uh, and, and mentioned specifically mentioned animal health and livestock disease, World Wildlife Fund in Scotland, uh, and also there's a, a new marginal abatement cost curve for Scottish agriculture from, from Michael and his colleagues at SRUC, uh, and Nigel's Ribbon and Health and Welfare Group, I'll say a little bit about that in a minute, and also a big recent report from a, a CL, CL, which is a big uh, a livestock consortium uh, in the UK. They've all identified livestock health status as a key constraint on efficient livestock production and the mitigation option for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As I said, it all seems very intuitive, but there isn't a huge amount of, of data, uh, and that's something we're keen to try and, and, and improve on, and that's kind of why we're here today. The first people to sort of get into this uh, is a report done through ADAS, and you might recognize that Adrian Williams and his team, Cranfield and, and others, were involved in this. Uh, and the idea here was to, was to rank, if you like, um, 10 most important uh, cattle health conditions uh, in terms of both the actual impact of the condition, but also the, the potential to uh, return that, if you like, through, through, uh, through suitable control and mitigation options. So there was a kind of carbon footprint of the, of the disease and, and also the, the sort of intervention, if you like. Uh, and you can see things like Yoni's disease were very high up there, salmonella as well, bovine viral diarrhea, um, infertility, fluke, uh, and a number of things like that. We were also tasked about the same time, uh, Michael's part of this, so down by association, to produce a rapid evidence assessment on the impact, the options, and the priorities for the major sheep and cattle diseases uh, in Scotland. Uh, that was the kind of starting point there, and these reports are available. I can I can uh, forward links uh, as and as required. I'm sure you've probably seen some of this information, but that was really to get, to sort of give a, an expert opinion, if you like, um, on on what options we had, what diseases we thought were important, uh, and as I say, there isn't a huge amount of empirical evidence to back some of this up. 
But we've tried to fill some of the knowledge gaps. And again, Michael's been part of this. Uh, uh, one of the things I'm a parasitologist by training, and it occurred to me that you know, parasites must be important in this discussion, and they are. Um, so we're specifically looking at the impact of parasitic gastroenteritis uh, on production and associated emissions. Uh, they're a major constraint on efficient livestock production. They have a very direct effect uh, on, on growth and appetite. Um, so they, they, they result in poor feed conversion efficiency and ill thrift, to use a, a Scottish term, so poor, poor production, poor growth rates. So a combination of field work that we've done and also abattoir studies that we've been involved in and chamber studies done at SRUC in their fantastic green cow climate chamber facility uh, revealed a significant reduction of between 10 and 30 percent in the greenhouse gas emissions associated with, in this case, effective and sustainable worm control in sheep and cattle. It was a, the abattoir work was, was all based in cattle and came in at about 15 percent right in the middle. So these are, these are significant savings uh, through sustainable worm control. And we also looked at liver fluke, which is a big uh, production disease in this part of the world because uh, we have a nice mild wet climate. Well, not, it's not, sometimes it's not that mild. Um, but this was, a, this was a combination of robust statistical analysis and greenhouse gas emissions modeling with Michael and colleagues. It's not straightforward. There are lots of caveats and confounding factors. Um, it's easy for, to look at abattoir data and the, the chap on the right there with the knife is, is declaring whether that liver's got fluke in it or not. Uh, it looks easy that well, the fluky animals are older, they're less, they've grown, you know, lower live weight and all the rest of it, but it's actually complicated when you break down these big data sets by sex, breed, age, and holding. A lot of these uh, factors sort of disaggregate and, and they, the, the greenhouse gas and production impacts look less convincing. Um, but we've also been involved in a meta-analysis of published papers, both on natural infections and, and artificial infections in, in the laboratory, if you like. But across the board, the consensus was a statistically significant 9% lower daily weight gain and a 6% lower live weight. Um, we, we got involved in a big, well, consider it relatively big study of a, a quarter of a million beef cattle up in the northeast of Scotland looking at the abattoir data. Um, fluke infection resulted in a 4% reduction in daily live weight gain and an extra 11 days to slaughter. And uh, Michael calculated that, that was a 2% increase in the associated greenhouse gas emissions. And that's based on real data um, and very robust statistical analysis. But that's most likely a significant underestimate because we have to remember that these animals uh, at the abattoir are the healthy ones. So, on the back of that and going on behind the scenes, there was a lot of discussion around, well, how, how do we prioritize health conditions and, and, and come up with practical interventions to help the industry actually move forward on this? Because I think there's a real desire to do that. So we established that a Safari Livestock Health and Greenhouse Gas Special Advisory Group, a discussion group, really, and Safari being the sort of blanket or umbrella organization, uh, the Scottish Environment, Food and Agriculture Research Institutes, of which more than an SRUC are too. Um, and that involved researchers, farmers, livestock industry representatives, government policy teams, but also around the same time, Nigel's UK-wide Women in Health and Welfare Group were, were having an online discussion uh, and a survey on, on their disease priorities, and they went into quite a lot of detail on that, again, uh, with over you know, nearly a thousand uh, correspondents and respondents on that is, is significant data. So working with, with the Women in Health and Welfare Group, uh, both groups, uh, our own uh, livestock health group, were keen to unpack what's really meant by livestock health in the context of greenhouse gas mitigation. There's a lot of talk, and as I said, a lot of these reports name it, but don't really go into much detail as to what they mean by that. And I guess what, what triggered our, you know, the, our action, if you like, to, to, to get on with this was the COP26 conference, the climate change conference that was held in Glasgow just about 40 miles away from here in November 2021. And one of the first kind of big outputs from that was a global methane reduction pledge to reduce methane by 30% by 2030. And despite the fact that the, the original pledge was really aimed at the waste and landfill and various other industries, um, the, the press here typically run with pictures of livestock, but that's, that's a story for another day. So 
over the, the following few weeks, we pulled together a report called Acting on Methane and Opportunities for the UK uh, Cattle and Sheep Sectors. So on, on behalf of the Morden Institute, but also the Women Health and Welfare Group with input from Michael and colleagues and others. So it's really to sort of describe well, why methane and why now and give the industry and farmers uh, some encouragement to, to do the right thing. Um, and the, one of the key questions was, well, which health conditions and why or how, why, why are they important and how do they impact on, on, on greenhouse gas emissions? And the big three, to, to put it bluntly, as far as reducing emissions, including methane, are concerned, and this, some of this comes back to things that really push the buttons in Michael's livestock greenhouse gas models would be things like higher growth rates and daily live weight gain because that reduces the days to slaughter or the days to first percolation, uh, better feed conversion efficiency which reduces the levels of inputs and, and increases growth rates and improves reproductive performance and less involuntary culling or abortion in the breeding stock which reduces replacement rates, increases reproductive performance, reduces numbers of followers and protects selective uh, genetics in the future. Uh, apologies for this table, it's not meant to be viewed on the screen, but it's just it pulled together uh, all the information we had really on the health conditions considered to negatively impact methane emissions from ruminants, how they impact and how they could be diagnosed and controlled. So the, the columns down the left would be things like the methane impact, so the growth rate, the feed conversion efficiency and the involuntary culling and how we think these different diseases map across those and also around prevalence. Is it a national problem? Is it a regional problem? Uh, are the are reports increasing, decreasing? Do we have good diagnostics? Have we got good treatment and prevention options? And also how is the degree of disease recognized? Is it, a, is it a top 10 health priority? Is it a welfare priority? Was it picked up by the uh, ADAS report and by our Scott Gov report? Are there trading issues around this like there would be with things like bovine tuberculosis? So it's really quite a comprehensive table just to try and pull together a lot of a lot of information. So apologies, it's not viewable, but it is viewable on the, hopefully on the report itself. And another thing that came up very strongly in discussions was it's not just about disease. And you know, I think as a disease person, I'm maybe a wee bit fixated on that. But uh, farmers and vets necessarily see diseases as such. They they think it's in terms of syndromes. Uh, they may have a disease basis, but they can't also be nutritional, genetic, managemental, environmental, or multifactorial in nature. And we're thinking of things like lameness, reproductive failure, neonatal disease uh, in, in that context. So really the aims of the report were to encourage and engage farmers and vets and advisors in discussions around animal health and greenhouse gas emissions in the context of methane and the methane report. And to devise practical and sustainable animal health interventions. And that's something we can do now. I think that, that was a key point that health is something we can improve straight away with the tools we already have. There is enough slack in this to do that. Um, while we wait for things like this, very impressive uh, science going on around the genetics, breeding, feeding, and novel feed additives and things, but they'll, they'll take a little time. This is something we can do now. Uh, but also to give cattle and sheep farmers options for improving good practice at their own farm level. So that's picking up on vaccination programs, improved biosecurity, uh, uh, more diagnostic testing, optimizing treatments. But also it gives industry and policy teams options to encourage good practice at, at more of a national level. So if you identify one or two key priority diseases or syndromes at farm level, but also national disease control or eradication strategies. For example, in Scotland, we have an active uh, BVD eradication scheme running, which will have implications for the, the carbon footprint of that sector. Uh, but also to highlight that good animal health status is a platform to allow the optimal expression of some of these really interesting uh, novel greenhouse gas mitigation measures, and glibly called breeding and feeding, but you know what I mean. It's breeding for reduced emissions, it's the NOP of these feed additives. If you haven't got a healthy herd and flock, you're not going to get optimal expression of, of the, the benefits of these kinds of, of measures. And finally, this came across very strongly from the industry too. We need to collect the appropriate data and metrics to ensure uptake. Um, farmers are asked for a lot of information as it is. We don't ask them for any more. So we need to make the best use of the information we have, but also collect the right kind of information. So we encourage uptake and compliance across the industry, but also to credit farmers and agriculture for making the required improvements. So I think that's to be done. I'll just leave you with a picture of some sheep 
amazing on, on the shore on one of the islands in the west of Scotland. Um, I thought they were doing their best to reduce their, their own carbon footprint, but I'm reliably informed the seaweed that they're grazing on isn't the right species. So uh, uh, I, thought, I thought I had a nice picture there, but I'll leave it there and thank a number of people for their help with the report and the research that's gone into behind the, the scenes. And I think hopefully hand over to Michael for a quick comment as I now stop sharing. Uh, thanks, Philip. Those were, that was a very nice uh, summary of, I think, where we're at um, in terms of this. Uh, anyway, I, I agree with you that I think there's quite a strong theoretical case that improving health can reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, for the reasons you explained. You know, it, we know that the sorts of things that drive emissions reductions, such as improving fertility, reducing mortality, uh, increasing live weight gain, increasing milk yields, and things like that, these all help to reduce the, the carbon footprint of meat or milk. Um, so there's a strong theoretical case for improving health and by doing that, reducing emissions or carbon footprint. Um, but in practice, it's maybe not made, but not made, maybe made as much progress in actually develop, you know, developing policies to put this into practice as we would have liked. And I think there are a, a few reasons for that. Um, I mean, there's, there's some health's complicated. It's more complicated than, than some other mitigation measures. So it's not always that easy to, to turn into concrete policies. And um, you've got problems such as some diseases require coordinated actions. So there's no point a farmer just acting on their own. They need, need a sort of regional or even national response. And there's also concerns about some of the treatments may have uh, negative effects in terms of leading to resistance and, and pathogens or something like that. I think there are there are two other sort of broad issues. One is um, lack of evidence of greenhouse gas effects. You know, we know there's a, a theoretical case, but in terms of convincing evidence, you know, the, we're, we're a bit um, thin on the ground when it comes to actual, you know, peer-reviewed papers and such like. And there's reasons for that, partly because it's difficult to collect that data. And when you do collect it, it's difficult to make a causal link because of the confounding factors, you know. There's other things that can lead to changes in performance apart from health, you know, genetics, feeding, housing, all sorts of things can, you know, confound it in this sort of picture. So that makes it difficult. And also some things are difficult to measure. For grazing animals, it's hard to measure the feed conversion ratio, which is actually pretty important um, to the, you know, the sort of emissions. Um, so lack of evidence on the effects is definitely a problem for policymakers. I'd say the other headache for policymakers is a rebound effects and by that I mean if you think about um, in current terms of cars when you improve the fuel efficiency of a car what happens is you know the car uses less petrol per mile but people can afford to drive more because it's cheaper to drive each mile so you get and in, in, in some cases you get you know you don't actually get a reduction in emissions you'd want to because people drive further and it's there's a that sort of similar issue I think with livestock you know if we improve the health of livestock our livestock sectors, those sectors are liable to become um, more animals to be healthier, obviously more productive, and our sectors become more competitive. So what could happen is that our sectors actually expand, which is good from a food security point of view. Um, just, it's a bit of a headache if you're in government and you've got to, your target is to reduce your national emission. You don't necessarily want your livestock sector to expand. Um, I mean, there's a bit of a tension here because it's a bit of a dilemma because in some in some ways, if someone, you know, if a country's got a, a very efficient low carbon sector, you do want it to expand because that will then displace production elsewhere and reduce global emissions. But it won't necessarily reduce emissions in that country and it'll make it more difficult for them to hit their, their sort of legal targets, their legal obligations. So there's a little bit of a tension here between, um, you know, improving efficiency, which could potentially lead to, you know, increases in total emissions while reducing emissions per unit of output. Um, and the current sort of policy setup doesn't deal with that that well. So I think there's a little bit of an issue there that needs to be to be addressed. Obviously, in theory, you could just whack a carbon tax on global commodities and it'd all be solved, but that's not really a, a realistic option at the moment, even if it's theoretically a good thing to do. So just to conclude, I'd say there's a degree there's a strong theoretical case um, that health can reduce certainly the emissions intensity, the emissions per unit of output. Um, but these rebound challenges, they really are a bit of a, a problem for policymakers. Um, the national inventory system is very useful, um, but it doesn't necessarily give 
it's not necessarily good at giving credit for when a country dis displaces emissions elsewhere in the world. It's it's really focused on measuring emissions at a national level. And there are techniques for doing this, such as life cycle analysis, can help us get a handle on these indirect effects. And so maybe, you know, augmenting national inventories with you know other analyses, other methods would be one way forward. And I'd certainly be interested in hearing people's thoughts on how we can better capture, better tell policymakers which health effects, you know, which improvements in health would actually lead to a tangible uh, change in their inventory emissions and which ones wouldn't. Um, because I think that would be quite useful information if we could at least give policymakers a better idea of where they're going to get rewarded for reducing emissions via health and where they're not. So that was uh, my sort of take on it, Philip. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for a very authoritative overview. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think there is a tension around the emissions intensity and the, the national totals. And that, you know, I thought we might have to sort of change the mindset a little bit, that farmers might have to consider farming with fewer, more efficient animals. Um, and that, that kind of goes against the way we've been doing things since the Second World War. Uh, so there's a bit of a change in mindset, but I think farmers need to feel that their contributions are valued and that they, you know, the, the metrics are actually capturing the right kind of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, of the, they're captured in the inventory as well. So they're, they're getting, you know, different sectors can sometimes get the credit for things that agriculture does. And I think that needs to be sorted out as well. And I think I mean, when one small scenario would be around unintended consequences, um, that I, mean, I deliberately didn't include a lot on reproductive performance in, in the in the, the methane report, because one of the things, if you improve, as you say, improve your reproductive success, then you have literally more animals on the ground and that can increase the size of the national flock and herd and that may not necessarily be a good idea from, from where we're standing. Um, mm. Also, I mean, this is an opportune time. There's a lot of policy discussions and policy development, certainly in this part of the world and I, I'm, I'm sure elsewhere, but that some of these good practices could be embedded in, in policy thinking. And so we need to make sure that policy teams of access to the right sort of information so it can embed the right kind of practice in, in, in future policy for whether it's UK farming or, or European or wherever. I think I mean, if, if you're happy to leave it there, I'm happy to leave it there. I'm very keen to hear others' perspectives sure. from, from across the UK, Europe and, and, the, and the world. Um, uh, but it's been an interesting little session and I uh, look forward to hooking up with everybody in the discussion afterwards. So we'll call it there and say goodbye. And hope the recording yeah. stops all by itself, as if by magic. Thanks, <laughs> okay, thank you. Hosting.